Hey everybody, welcome to another M365.video SharePoint short. This is David Warner. Today we're gonna to talk about how we can combine the SharePoint framework and dynamic CSS styles. In the video, we'll start out by looking at the different style options that are available to us, CSS versus SAS. We'll see even within SAS, there's different options we have versus a module or a non-module. And then we're gonna quickly jump into the demos to see exactly how we can import these style options. We'll start out with basic CSS, and then we'll go ahead and start jumping into the modules versus non-modules of how to import the different SAS files and what the differences mean when we do use a module versus a non-module. Before we get into the demos, let's take a look at our style options. If we have classic CSS, we can absolutely use that within our SharePoint framework solutions. It's not a problem. Now, they are fully supported, but you lose some advanced features that are provided by SAS. So we want to keep that in mind. It may be necessary to start with them because they're already there and available to us. We may already have pre-created CSS styles that we're going to utilize, but we'll definitely want to look to replace them likely as soon as possible, given some of the benefits that we'll see we receive when we do use SAS. Now, when it comes to using SAS, I'm not going to dive too deep into the benefits. There's a lot of material out there to read about all the benefits that are available, such as variables and advanced features that we likely would want to use in our SharePoint framework solutions. What we are going to look at, though, is the multiple ways in which we can include SAS styles into our SharePoint framework solutions. The first is that when you use SAS styles as a module, meaning that the file name includes modules, as we'll see in the demo, our class names become dynamically hashed. Now this sounds fancy, but what's really just happening is our class names get a unique string added to the end of every class name. If there were conflicts, for example, if we had a class name called header text and another solution that's loaded on the page has something called header text, we might see a cross-contamination of styles overriding one another in ways that we don't desire. But there may be times when we need to preserve the original class names, and that is possible. We'll see that in this video series as well. And so we can make that happen if we need to by using either a non-module or another method within the SAS style sheets. Now, no matter what method we choose, classic CSS, modularized SAS, non-modularized SAS, it's important to note that all of our styles are bundled into JavaScript by the SharePoint framework and then dynamically added to the page as a style block during rendering. It's not added as an external style sheet unless we explicitly do that. If we're using the default bundling techniques of the SharePoint framework, the styles are added to our JavaScript files and then put into the head tag of our page within a style block for us. So now that we have a basic understanding of the style options that are available to us, let's jump over into Visual Studio Code and see how we can actually implement the importation of these different options. For this demo, I've started out by creating a basic SharePoint Framework application customizer extension. Now, the concepts that you're going to see in this demo are applicable to all the various types currently available within the SharePoint framework, whether it's an extension or web part. But for the purposes of this demo and the second video in this series, the application customizer makes the most sense. I've created a styles folder where all of our styles, whether they be CSS or SAS, will be placed for the course of the demo series. To begin with, we're going to work with our CSS file. Now this just includes some very basic styles, the top of which are called site header, site body, section header, section body. They don't really do anything but set the visibility to visible, and that's not necessarily relevant. What we want to note is that the names are very generic. Site header and site body, all the rest are very generic and could have a conflict somewhere else on the page. The last styles, though, are meant for applying a shadow when a hover state is invoked on whatever we apply the CSS to. We might typically want to apply something like this to a list formatting definition, perhaps somewhere within a web part, but that's the purpose of this style. Now let's go ahead and close out our CSS file and open up our TypeScript file. Go ahead and close that, open up our TypeScript file, and we can see that this is just a very basic TypeScript file for application customizer. What we're gonna do now is show you how to import your CSS file. Before we add the logic that will import the CSS, I did wanna point out that we wanna pay attention to one location within our folder structure here, and that's our dist folder. Now this is the folder that the gulp task runner when we're serving up our solution and we're making changes and the webpack comes in and takes whatever changes we made and regenerates the JS files for us. The dist folder or the distribution folder is, is where those files will be created. Now I want you to take note of it because we're gonna refer to it a number of times throughout this video series. Let's go ahead and go up into the section where our make import statements are located and we'll just paste in our code for importing the styles CSS. Now we notice it's making a relative reference and if you pay attention to the distribution folder over here, you'll notice that when Gulp has finished webpacking, 
we get our importation application customizer file. And remember, this is the JavaScript file for our solution that includes all the functionality for our solution. Now, in this case, it's very simple. There's not a lot going on. But what we do know we've included is the reference to the styles. So if we go ahead and click on our file and do a find, and we'll look for PNP hover button state, we see there it is on line 152. Now this means that once we uh, package up and install our SharePoint Framework solution, whatever site this is installed on will include these styles available to use throughout that site. As we mentioned previously at the beginning of the video, this is the most simplistic way to include styles in our SharePoint Framework solution. But there's definitely more advanced features that we can take advantage of by using SAS. So let's reset the demo and let's take a look at how we can include a non-modularized SAS file in our SharePoint Framework solution. I've reset our TypeScript file back to its original form. You'll now notice though that instead of just the generic CSS file, in our styles folder we've got a SAS file. So let's go ahead and open this SAS file and you'll notice it's the exact same makeup of our CSS file. It's just now actually considered a SAS file as you'll see here by the logo, the different naming extension, uh, it can be treated like a normal SAS file. So it, even though this is still just plain CSS, we could include other SAS features such as variables to be used within this file that maybe reference another file where the variables are declared. Uh, it's a much more robust architecture for us to build a more advanced solution for our styles. Let's go ahead and close our SAS file and go back to our TypeScript file and we'll add the logic necessary for importing this SAS file. And we'll go ahead and select save. Now remember to keep an eye on the distribution folder over here because once Webpack is completed, it's going to populate our distribution folder with our application customizer JS file. And we'll go ahead and open that. Just like we did with our plain CSS, let's now go ahead and do a search for one of our styles. We'll go ahead and select Control F to search and we'll do a search for PNP button hover style. There we go, on line 161 we can see it's been included from our SAS file. Now this doesn't look much different from having imported the regular CSS, and with this analysis you're right, but remember this was imported as a SAS file, so if we had included variables or any of the other functionality available to us through SAS, that would have been handled and recognized appropriately during the SharePoint Framework bundling process. You also might remember that I had mentioned that using SAS will hash our style names, and in this case, no hashing or changing of the style name has occurred. This is because we imported it as a non-module SAS file. And we know that by looking at our SAS file here, it would normally include the name of our file .module.scss. But in this case, it only has a name .scss. So this treats it as if it's a SAS non-modularized file, allows us to still utilize the benefits of SAS, but doesn't enforce the hashing if we may find ourselves in a scenario where we need to ensure hashing is not occurring for our entire file. Let's now reset our demo back to its original state and let's take a look at how we can import a modularized SAS file and how that differs from what we've seen so far. Okay, now we're back to the original state of our demo, ready to import styles. You'll notice now though, we've got a modularized SAS file ready and waiting for us. And we know that because it now has the name .module.scss. So we'll go ahead and open this file and we'll notice it's no different from the others. It includes the generic names, it includes our PNP button hover styles, and it's ready for us to import. So let's go ahead and close this and go back to our TypeScript file for our extension. And we'll go ahead and go up to our import section and we'll paste in our import logic for our module. We'll go ahead and select save. Now again, keep your eye on the distribution folder because once Webpack is completed, it's going to show us our JavaScript files for this solution. All right, it's done. We'll go ahead and open our application customizer. And just like in the other scenarios, we'll go ahead and do a search on our PNP button hover style. But you'll notice now it looks a little different. Now we see the difference between the two previous examples and the modular ISAS file. It's taken our styles and added on the hash to the end of all the class names. This ensures that our class names are unique. So site header is no longer just plain site header. It's site header underscore and then the hashed value. But we can't be expected to remember this hash value for every single one of our styles. In fact, each time Webpack runs, it's going to create a new hashed value. So let's jump back to our TypeScript file and see how we can make a modification to our import statement that allows us to access our style class names without having to worry about the hashed value. So we'll go ahead and close our bundled JavaScript file, and that'll take us back to our primary TypeScript file. We're gonna go ahead and modify our import statement by giving a name to the module that we're importing, which in this case is our SAS styles file. 
So we'll go ahead and click here at the front of import. We'll paste the name styles button shadows. This is just the name that I'm going to give to it. We could name it anything and I'm gonna type from. And now that completes the import statement. What we're saying is I wanna import those styles within that module file, but I wanna import them in a named space called styles button shadows. And you'll notice when I hover over it, it's kind of grayed out. And what that means is that we're declaring it, but we're never actually reading it or using it. So if I were to compile my solution right now, the styles would not be included. But what I can do within this solution, whether it be a web part or an extension, is I can reference that now, styles button shadows dot, and you can see now it gives me access to my other styles. I can select that and now that would actually put in that hashed value when I save. So I don't have to remember all of those hashes that are applied to my style names. Now there may be a time when we wanna take advantage of using a SAS module, but we still need to preserve the non-hashed class name of one or more of our styles. And so in part two of this video series, we're going to take a look at how that can be accomplished. We're going to modify our SAS files so that some styles will be preserved. Their original class names will not be hashed and we'll be able to reference them in, for example, a list formatting definition. We're also gonna see how we can dynamically bundle multiple SAS files and then load those files in dynamically based on a SharePoint framework extension property. Thanks for watching the video. You can find the link to part two of this video series in the blog post. And feel free to reach out to me with the contact information you see on your screen if you have any questions. Thanks again.